<sighs> I figured it was about time I make something like this. Today, we're gonna be starting something of a mini series on software architecture, specifically, of course, my opinions on how I like to architect real-time applications and games. Of course, we're gonna be focusing on simplicity. We're not gonna get too crazy with complexity here because, well, to be honest, there's no reason to make things complicated, especially if your scale is quite small. This is somewhat inspired by recent code review monstrosities. When you start to introduce sub game loops for no reason like this, it just destroys like the flow of your code. However, to be honest, this is something that I've been wanting to make for like the last five years, probably since the beginning of starting the code review series. I also put up a poll and asked you guys what kind of technologies I should use for this series since it's not really going to matter since we'll be focusing on the architecture, not specific technologies. However, as you can see from 14,000 people as of recording this video, OpenGL was the winner for that. So that is what we're gonna be using for this series slash application. However, I wanna stress that literally anything can be used here. You'll clearly see the places where I I'm using OpenGL and other libraries and you can just substitute them for whatever you want because the concepts are all the same. And again, we're gonna be focusing on the architecture of our own code here. We're also gonna be doing this one step at a time. So in today's video, we're gonna be specifically focusing on the application system, the window system, the main loop and how to create applications based off of that architecture. So what you are looking at here is really the first step that pretty much everyone should be making. And that is separating out the core from their actual applications. The reason why put simply is is because this area that contains our application specific user code. So in other words, that's kind of your code. That's the code that makes this app, this app. It's the custom functionality that actually drives the behavior of the specific application that you're making. That should be its own separate world compared to all of the reusable systems that really form the core of potentially any application that you might be making. Usually this module over here would be a static library. And this would of course be your actual executable. The core library is going to contain things like the application system, the window system, layers, which we will talk about in future videos, as well as the event system. It's also gonna have the main loop, of course. The main application loop will be controlled by this core library, and then you can hook into it where required for custom behavior. Usually you're gonna to need to have some sort of renderer or at least a collection of utilities because rendering is usually quite core to an actual application. It's also something that usually needs to be extended and made custom for your specific application, but the core renderer's job is just to provide that actual core layer as well as utilities to make things easier. And then of course, other core reusable things. There are so many different applications that one might wish to create. You might want support for audio. You might want support for networking. These are just some examples of things that can of course be reusable and thus you'd probably put them in the core library. Now, this is probably a good place to introduce the fact that this may not just be one module. I've drawn this as a single module, a single static library. However, as you begin to add more and more functionality, which may or may not be required for specific applications, you may wish to segregate all of that functionality into individual separate modules, such as dynamic libraries. Likewise, your application may also contain things that might not quite fit into core, but could also be reusable or separated into other modules. The core relationship that we're showing here though, is that we have this like core layer of things that aren't specific to this application. And that's also the functionality that we are providing in sort of a broad spectrum case, or at least a broader spectrum. And then we have the application specific things which use our APIs as well as our systems, but also may introduce specific things for the specific application that we're actually making. Speaking of things we need to think about, have you been thinking about your online security? make sure you check out Surfshark, the sponsor of this video. If you're not familiar with a VPN, a virtual private network, it's basically a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. It hides your real location, encrypts your traffic, and makes it look like you're browsing the internet from somewhere else. And Surfshark takes all of that and packages it into what I think is a really cool and affordable product. I'm in Japan right now, but I'd like to pretend that I'm still back home in Melbourne, Australia. And I can do that, both for work purposes or if I just want my streaming service to think I'm in another country that has my favorite show. That's called Geo Unblocking, by the way, and it's awesome. It's also really great for security because who knows what's happening if I connect to some public Wi-Fi in a cafe, someone might be stealing my information, but if it's all going through Surfshark VPN, then it's protected. One of my favorite things about Surfshark is it lets you use it on unlimited devices with a single subscription. So aside from all of my devices, like my laptop, my iPad, and my phone, my entire family who's traveling with me can also use it to stay safe and secure. And Surfshark even blocks trackers, ads, and malware with their clean web feature. Right now, there are 
offering a huge discount and a 30 day money back guarantee. So you can try it risk free. So go to surfshark.com slash the churner link will be in the description below or use code the churner to get four extra months of Surfshark VPN. Huge thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. So how does this translate into an actual project? Well, I've put together a repository. This is what it looks like clean. We have an app directory and a core directory. Inside core, we have all of the stuff related to our core library, as you would expect, as well as a separate CMakeList file to build that core module. And then likewise, we have an app directory with resources as well as source code related to our application. I'm using CMake here to define the project structure and build system for this project, as well as fetch and set up all of the dependencies that we need. Now, I'm not gonna be talking about CMake or the build system in this specific video. If you want me to make a video specifically talking about that, let me know in the comment section below. But really, this applies to any build system, of course. That's kind of separate to the actual architecture that we're talking about today, as long as you have this set up correctly please. So over here in Visual Studio, you can see the up and core projects. We have the static library and we have the exe file. Let's have a look at the main function inside the app module. This is what it looks like. You see how nice and clean it is? Because fundamentally, this is just the entry point of our application. It really shouldn't do anything aside from just launch our application. I get it. Sometimes you're making tiny projects and you just write everything all in the one file. That's okay. But if you're actually trying to create something of really any scale above just a simple text, Test, then this is what I like to see when I look at main functions. Something super simple, easy to understand, and a very clear API. Before we start taking a deeper look at this, let's actually launch the application and see what we have. So what we've got here is a very simple application. We just launch it like so, and we have this flame. This is being rendered using OpenGL just in a fragment shader. Here is the fragment shader that is rendering this, and this is just something that I got from Shader Toy. Here it is over here by XT95. I'll leave a link to this in the description below. So let's take a look at the main function as well as the rest of the application architecture we have here today. First of all, we have this thing called an application specification. This is just a struct. In this case, it contains a name and a window specification, which contains some window parameters, which we may want to define. And that clearly defines some parameters that we're going to be using to actually create our application. Now note that this is of course totally serializable. You could get this really from anywhere. You might wish to save the last size of your window to disk and then read it somewhere before you actually create your application with these parameters. But one option like we have here is just to list them all out like this and then create an application with them. We then push a layer. Now we're going to be talking about layers in much more depth in a future video. However, we will touch on them briefly here today because of course they're part Part of our core architecture. A layer is simply a way for us to introduce custom behavior to our application. So in this case, what you are seeing over here, that is all driven by this app layer. If we just comment that out, then we'll literally get just an empty application that does nothing. So we create our application with the given specification, we push on a layer of our custom functionality, and then we run the application. This will actually start our main loop and it will block this function until the program terminates, meaning that any any functionality we want to add goes into a layer. So what are these layers anyway? Let's have a look. As a quick little side note, I have talked about layers before in the game engine series. I'll leave that video linked up there. It is quite old and this is slightly different. However, I guess the main concept is pretty much the same. Layer is a class that is pretty much an interface, although it does have some empty implementations of these functions so that we can optionally override them. And it simply allows us to more or less define what should happen on an event, such as like if a key is pressed, what should happen when the application is updated every frame with a particular time step, as well as what this specific layer would like to render. Now you can extend this any way you like. That is kind of framework dependent, I guess. It depends what you're trying to make. But I would say that these three functions are probably the most important. So layer, as I mentioned, is inside the core library. However, the app layer, which is our application specific functionality is inside the app project. And if we have a look at what app layer does, it derives from layer. It provides a constructor and a destructor and it overrides only some of the methods that it actually wants to use. So in this case, on update, on render, we don't care about events at the moment. We'll actually be talking about the event system in a future video. The constructor is responsible for initializing and creating all the resources for this layer and the destructor should be getting rid of them. You can see the resources that we're creating in OpenGL over here. So if we have a look at the constructor, we're simply going through and actually using the core API in this case to create a graphics shader with a vertex and a fragment shader. We're creating the geometry that we're trying to render, which in this case is a full screen 
screen triangle, which will run this shader. The destructor is releasing everything on update, which is called every frame with a time step is not being used at the moment. And then on render is what actually does the rendering by binding our shader, setting up all of our uniforms and viewport, and then doing the actual geometry rendering, which in this case is going straight to the swap chain. So that is literally all of the code that is inside this app module. We've just looked at all of it. And that gives us this running application, which is resizable and everything and behaves as you would expect. So that is really one of the most important things that I want to mention here today. And that is just how clean all of this is and how it lets us separate our actual code that we care about working on, that we care about reading, that defines what it is our program is actually doing. It separates all of that from things like the main loop and the state machine and the event system and what whatever else we might have in our program that is completely irrelevant. We want a nice little playground sandbox for us to actually define all the functionality that is related to what we are trying to do and work in a nice, clean, organized environment. And that is what this is. If I suddenly want to create a completely different application that might have very different functionality, I don't have to even worry about like implementing the main loop or caring about what that is and what it does. I can simply create this main function, which does whatever I need it to do and pushes on a layer with my own custom functionality. And that's it. I have a super clean way to implement exactly what I want the application to do. And I really don't have to worry about any of those backend details. Of course, you can also use multiple layers and transition between them. And that is what we'll be talking about probably in the next video in this series. But for the simple case, this is really all you need. So let's have a look at how this actually works. So the application class, what does that contain? At the moment, you can see it is rather simple. So the constructor of application will initialize GLFW and set up our window. Those are the main things that it's responsible for. GLFW is the cross-platform library that we're using to actually create our window and set up an open gel context for us. It's also got other important cross-platform utilities such as getting the current time as well as handling events. We then create a window with our window specification. Window is a class that basically abstracts all the GLFW code that we need to run in order to actually create our window and set up our rendering context. It just lets us keep things a little bit cleaner than they otherwise would have been. One reason why having this window class separate is important is because you may wish to create multiple windows. So a really common, I guess, use case for that is if you're using IAM GUI and you want to drag a panel out and then it will dynamically become its own window, you want that reusable functionality in a class because just putting all of that GLW stuff here kind of implies that maybe your application only has a single window or you'd have to go through and basically copy and paste this code in functions that might need to dynamically create a window. So that's why that design exists. You only have one instance of this application class, which is why we are setting this up as somewhat of a singleton here, just so that we can globally access it. This is important, for example, in app layer when we're actually trying to get the time of the application or getting the frame buffer size so that we can set the OpenGL viewport. We could provide every layer with a way to actually access the application instance. However, since there is guaranteed to only be one, making it globally accessible like this just makes things a little bit easier. Over here inside application run, we have the main loop, which is super simple. While the application is running, we simply poll events. We check to see if a close has been requested and if so, we'll stop the application and break out of this loop. All stop does, by the way, is it just sets running to false. And that's one of the reasons why we actually have a while loop over running rather than over window should close because that way we can simply call the stop function if we would like to. And since that sets running to false on the next iteration, we'll come up here and exit out of this loop. That will in turn come back over here, exit out of this function and destroy application as we get out of this scope. And that will destroy the window and terminate GLFW. It'll also set our little pointer over here to null pointer since there is no more valid instance of the application class. We do some timing over here to figure out our time step or our delta time. We're also clamping it to some reasonable range and then over here, we're going to iterate through our layers inside our layer stack and both update and render them. Now, as you can see with this design, we actually have update and render just one after the other, which means that, of course, we could literally move all of this stuff into app layer on update and there would be no difference. The reason why render and update are separated is basically because of this comment over here. Rendering doesn't necessarily have to happen immediately after updating like this. It could happen on a render thread, in which case, of course, it needs to be separated. And in OpenGL's case, where OpenGL can really only be used from one thread, we would have to make sure that all of our GL functions are running from that render thread. The other reason to actually separate update and render is in case 
one layer's rendering might want to use some data from another layer. In that case, we probably wouldn't want to render using potentially stale data if this was just being updated one layer after the other. We make sure that all of the updating that sorts out our data and makes it ready for rendering across all layers is completed first before we actually go ahead and start doing any rendering. I guess another reason is it's also kind of useful for profiling. We can see how long rendering takes versus updating. We can try and optimize those things. I mean, there are lots of reasons why why you, you want to separate these two. But I guess just looking at the code and seeing them happen sequentially, I'm explaining why you do indeed still want to have them separate or at least some reasons. Then we do window update, which will actually swap buffers. So this is what presents our swap chain image to our window. And in OpenGL, this will probably be a GPU sync point as well, especially if we have vSync set to true, because in that case, it will actually wait for that vertical sync before continuing on to the next iteration to our next frame. We just have some other useful functions over here. And that is pretty much the entire application class. Class. Now, as I mentioned, layers and the layer stack we will be talking about in a future video and we'll actually be expanding the system a lot. This is very, very primitive at the moment, but it gets the job done. You can see I've got a vector of unique pointers because this is the single ownership point of layers in general. Of course, you can use them in many, many different places. However, this is defining like a strong ownership of when we actually create a layer. In this case, it's a unique pointer that is owned by the application. If you have any questions about this design or anything that we've talked about here today, then leave a comment below. As I mentioned, this code will be available in a GitHub repository, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. Next time, we'll either be taking a look at the layer system or the event system. Let me know what you want to see in the comment section below. The layer system will expand quite a bit and will also be including a statement machine to go between layers. That's super important because the layer system, of course, controls the actual functionality of our application. And then the event system, which integrates into layers as well, is how we actually define what happens when certain events happen in our application. So when we move our mouse, when we click on something, when we press something on our keyboard, when the window resizes, stuff like that. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and you found it helpful. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button, leave some feedback in the comment section below, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.